Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget a year end fundraising campaign, I guess. Well, what is that campaign? Me asking for you to donate money uh, at the end of the year. Uh, as you look at your tax situations, we are a 501c3 in the US. And if you're not in the US, well, I guess just do it because you like what we do. Be back in a few seconds with Tom Ferguson. We're going to talk further about the perfect storm gathering in the 2022 and 2024 elections. So I'm continuing my discussion with Tom Ferguson about a study he's done uh, of the 2020 elections and what that tells us about 2022. Thanks for joining us again, Tom. Well, I'm glad to still be here, Paul. <laughs> okay. Just one more time, Tom's a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, director of research at the Institute of New Economic Thinking and a senior fellow at Better Markets. All right, so in your paper, you've done a breakdown that a, a, a very disproportionate amount of money uh, of fossil fuel and private equity went to Trump and especially to the whole Republican Party, not just to Trump. There was a concerted effort to make sure the Republicans were very successful at all the down ballot races. Uh, so is there, is there some kind of split in the financial sector? You have people like Wall Street, I'm sorry, like BlackRock on Wall Street, making a lot of noise about climate change. Uh, but how serious is this block of money that's going to actually try to stop any real policy being passed? Okay, let's let's begin with my usual disclaimer that you know I wrote with two co-authors who are really brilliant, you know Paul Jorgensen and G. Chen. And in that respect, it's our research. Um, now, in the paper, uh, which which is on the INET website, you can get it there. Um, the um, we are talking about the specifically about the presidential breakdown in there. I don't doubt you're right on the congressional on all the congressional money um, there, but we didn't. You know, our our figures are, now that we were interested in in the fossil fuel folks, if you like, uh, because of our earlier the earlier part of the paper on agriculture. Um, where we found that the farming uh, support for Trump is really was really huge, and it eventually dawned on us um, that you know uh, not only do the large family farms that now dominate American farming totally dominated, I would add, um, there. Uh, those folks uh, really don't like being uh, regulated on water very much have except for a, you know a few folks doing um uh, sort of organic farming of whom there are not large numbers i mean most food in the united states isn't organic you know point you will just go to a supermarket and find out yourself uh, there in the old george bush fashion if you remember that first bout of inflation there um there um the um the farm people are out there, natural opponents, and they also don't like labor unions. Um, and, and it was the, we were struck by the pattern of how urban money streams from urban areas to be spent out out in the peripheral parts of the states, if you like. And we were trying to document uh, that pattern. Now, when we looked at and a pretty obvious link. A, a, a pretty obvious way to think about this was, okay, who's got the huge instinct uh, in keeping Trump around and fossil fuels was, you know, came right to mind. Uh, and so we looked at oil, coal, and then we looked at private equity. Now the private equity story is an extreme free market one. Now what we found there was pretty interesting and somewhat different from previous years. In 2016, we'd actually done this study, uh, the three of us. Um, the private equity was the only big part of the financial sector that really had major support for Trump before the election. I mean, they liked Trump at the start, uh, and we documented that. Um, and it's fun to watch other people. Tom, Tom, for, for people who aren't 
following this as closely as you do. What, how do you differentiate private equity from other parts of the financial sector? The, the, these folks basically buy and sell companies and run them themselves and try to take advantage of the difference that results when you restructure them. I'll put it that way. It's not just buying some paper assets, shuffling them around, buying foreign exchange, though they all do that. And in practice, the links between private equity and, say, hedge funds are often sometimes difficult to tell. Uh, but the, what these folks do a lot of active management, which gives them... So does that mean they're they're more directly connected to trying to make sure wages are as low as possible and such? Yeah, yes, a point we've made over and over. Yes, um, that was yes, exactly that, uh, and also anything else that stops you from doing exactly what you want, like regulations with your firm, whatever it is. You know, if you want to go uh, throw out the garden, you can throw out the garden instead of all the water supply or whatever, not that anybody would. Um, they just want to be able to do it. They're, these are the most extreme laissez-faire people going. I mean, they also buy hospitals, for example, a separate problem, not one we're going to deal with. Anyway, so when we, this time, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on in private equity. Uh, with the data set, you know, we, we just sort of set out the results in the paper. Um, and what we find there is that the smaller private equity folks act like ordinary finance in general, which doesn't particularly show heavily for Trump. I mean, there was something of a turn away from him in 2020 on that. I think COVID probably played a role in that because it was the Trump policies were so crazy that they discussed it. They, they, we also showed they discussed it a lot of science and technology uh, workers by inference because in the areas where they are, there's a big loss in votes there. Um, but the, that was... Uh, but the big private equity players, the folks in the Forbes 400 are in private firms that were, which the size of the, we use the top Fortune 350, and these are usually privately held, not publicly held, but they're the same size. Those folks were overwhelmingly for Trump. And that uh, is just an amazing finding um, because these folks are probably, apart from some pockets of Silicon Valley, probably the richest, fastest growing at rates of riches, richness uh, in the United States. And for that matter, maybe in the world. Uh, and so like, that's a real warning that uh, if you like the express train of history may not be running in quite the way you were all thinking when you talk about green finance uh, there. Now, the other thing we sort of did on that was to, we spent some time looking at oil companies, which I've done for years. I taught at the University of Texas and I knew and know people in that industry still. Um, and um, you could see that all this talk about green finance, I should say that uh, I and I, probably my colleagues over here, I, a little, it's not in the paper. Um, I'm quite unhappy with lots of talk of green finance because when you uh, study that, it turns out to mean let's give, let's let um, Goldman Sachs and everybody else do their usual markup on some kind of a bond. And you know, my take is you could get the same effect much more simply. You could simply tell banks if you want to be in business, um, you better make some green loans, and then you need a good criterion for green loans. We know that greenwashing has heavily hit both the European Union and a lot of private talk about this all over the world. Well, put that to one side. Anyway, here's the point where we go. Um, what you got is, uh, for sure, investors who now, you know, they, they even bought slots on the Exxon board. And they push the large oil companies to diversify out uh, from some of their oil fields and, and, and push a more rapid transition to a non-fossil future. Now, what is happening is that those, uh, when you study that process, those oil fields are being bought, uh, sometimes by private equity backed folks, but certainly by a lot of middle level oil companies. Now, middle level oil companies would be by anything except the oil industry standard, gigantic businesses. Uh, they're really large. 
Um, and so uh, what you get is this kind of shuffle between, all right, so the large firms uh, d diversify out of this, um, and then the medium-sized folks, the private equity folks are picking up these legacy fields. If you think like I think and like they think, uh, or my colleagues think, we know perfectly well. You, know, you spend political money to block things, and those legacy assets, they'll actually tell you that you can read it in the newspapers. Those legacy aspects that everybody is sort of thinking is on their way out, they can run those things for years at a big profit, and there's a lively trade in that. So the notion that you could, there's a clear financial constituency but also in the those legacy industries, coal and oil, to just hang on and use that stuff. And what we show you is those folks are overwhelmingly Republicans. Now, you know, everybody knows Nancy McLean's book on the Cokes. That's all true. Uh, though, you know, she comes in for all kinds of ridiculous criticism, most recently from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and... Um, this stuff isn't going away. And so you've got this gigantic block of legacy uh, fossil fuel folks sitting there. And in the, now they're, you know, it doesn't take a brain to realize, gee, funny, they look like they're in the West Virginia Democratic Party. <laughs> Perhaps they're. I was, I was just about to say, as Joe Manchin's part of this, it's not just the Republicans. That's right. This is no, no. I mean, I have spent years working on oil. I have had Democratic oilmen give me their private paper. So, so let me, let me. So, there's a section of capital, private equity, big and small, fossil fuel, coal, especially, but not just. But there's a section. What? But there's a oil. But there's a section of capital, and and maybe the most visible is BlackRock which is one of the Goliaths on Wall Street, but it actually does seem more aligned with the Democratic Party. Uh, certainly, they've got one of their guys is now uh, one of the senior advisors to Biden. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, is traditionally more allied with the Democrats, although I have to say there's a great quote from Larry Fink that says, in spite of everything I think of Trump, he did check off every single thing on our bucket list. <laughs> But, but no. there does seem to be a division between some sections of Wall Street that see a more systemic problem that actually, at, at least at some level, needs to be addressed, especially climate, uh, and a sections that don't give a shit. This isn't in the paper, but I'm willing to just stick my neck out here. I've looked around on this a bit. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of financiers, if you look at sort of upper class voters they've got a different ranking of how important climate change is from most voters who are much closer to the yellow vests in france who just said what are you talking about we're trying to live through the end of the month not you know the next decade or something like that you know you get the occasional jeff bezos uh, or somebody who's talking or um Peter Thiel, who's talking about Mars or some other place, but most people don't think they're going anywhere. And, you know, in a large chunk of Silicon Valley is overhung with wildfire smoke now for, you know, reliably some months of the every year. Um, and so it's not very surprising that the problem of climate, I, I mean, I actually, Joel Rogers and I had an old book on the Democrats and the um when did that come out? In 86, where we just sort of say, hey, look, you know, there's a lot of folks out there uh, who are pretty affluent, who actually get threatened by, uh, well, we didn't use the term climate change, but it was precisely the same sort of the heavy pollution, not to mention nuclear reactors, just, you know, 40 or 50 miles from the New York Times downtown office uh, up there. Uh, who, so that, you know, it's not surprising. There's a very affluent constituency that will rank that very high. I don't find that suspicious or weird at all. That's exactly what I think probably should be happening. Um, now, uh, the problem is, is that nearly every way you do this uh, on climate change has very important redistributional implications. Bluntly, the rich can afford a Tesla. The rest of us cannot. 
Um, and yes, we can hope that the Biden program to bring down the cost of electric batteries works, it succeeds. Uh, but, you know, the transition's going to be bumpy. It's going to be bumpy in Europe and a lot of other places, too. And uh, so I myself think that if you're asking me, which I guess you are, uh, <laughs> this business of uh, political money and exploiting uh, problems in, in costs is going to be with us for a very long time. It's going to lead to a real mess. It's already immobilized French politics, I think. You can see that. It is probably, it's a factor in German politics. Um, and, you know, in Austria, the Greens, which are pathetic to begin with, in the terms they have just weak policies in that uh, coalition there, uh, are also pretty, uh, they're not popular in the rest of the country. Right, Tom. There was an editorial in the Washington Post uh, a few months before the 2020 election. And I, I thought it was very interesting and it didn't get much attention, I don't think. It said the, the, the wedge issue, the big issue the Democrats, Biden could win on, would be climate. That, he, that, that the climate denying of Trump is an issue that could, could actually win over some Republicans. And, and then I looked uh, just a few weeks ago, I looked at a Pew study uh, breaking down attitudes in the Republican Party on climate. And of people who identify as, uh, what's the word, extreme conservative or very conservative, 10% considered climate in their top three issues, and 27% said they were greatly concerned. In, in Virginia and other places, if the Democrats, it seems to me, in close swing states, had really front and center hammered uh, the climate change issue, and they could have picked up a percentage of those Republicans who really do care about climate. It might have been enough, but they don't do it because I guess because they're afraid of the fossil fuel industry. Um, well, yeah, I also think that probably some of those identifying climate, they are extreme conservatives and they are extremely rich. That's you know, and they may have other interests that would forever block them from the. Uh, even, you know, like, look, every business organization in the United States of any size has rejected the original modest Biden tax program, uh, you know, that was basically a minor hike on income taxes. You know, now we're looking around for all these substitutes to uh, keep to try to neutralize the impact of what's a pretty modest spending over 10 years. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, the, the original genius of the Green New Deal was precisely that it fixed you know, jobs and redistribution right in the climate change. But when the Democratic leadership rejected that, which it did, I thought that was going to be trouble. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that, you know, not particularly insightful observation is turning out to be true. Um, the job story uh is really really important and you know the biden folks have done the best they could and even that and that wasn't much to begin with and it's less now i mean they got a they got a serious long-term problem here on that i've talked about this a lot on the air the, the one of the things that they could have done is this issue of a, a serious just transition for example uh, really offering fossil fuel workers wage subsidies so as they're transitioned out of fossil fuel industry, they don't lose a dime. And my understanding is that it wouldn't actually cost very much for the feds to do that. But they don't go front and center on this just transition. In West Virginia, if they wanted to weaken Joe Manchin, uh, that's what they'd be campaigning on. But they don't. Yeah, there's the old James Baker and George Schultz proposal to do a, uh, a tax on carbon uh, that is then recycled right back into people's pockets. Uh, so it would be income neutral. If you, and, and I'm not a big fan of the carbon taxes because the evidence on that, Michael Grubb has a good summary for INET, uh, is that there's not a lot of substitution uh from that even in buildings where you'd think there should be but 
uh, yeah, the Democratic corporate leader, the corporate Democratic leadership that controls Congress and dominates the White House is almost brain dead on these issues, and they're they're not even trying. And they got a yeah, they got a they got a problem. I mean, they it could be that they can uh, choke on their corporate money, if you like. A King Midas disease could hit the Democrats in the end, which is a way of rephrasing what you just said said to me. King Midas disease of a very odd kind. Uh, the quote I read uh, from the from your paper and your call, you and your colleagues paper uh, in the part. And when I started my intro in part one, you ended with saying uh, a putsch is not out of the questions again, uh, essentially. And, and these sections of capital you're talking about, the private equity funds, fossil fuel, uh, even though they and, and not only them who said that they weren't going to fund uh, those uh, uh, politicians that were in on January 6th, clearly they are still funding them. And these Republicans are not afraid of not being funded. Um, the, the, what, what do you see as, as the danger here? You ended this, your, dot, your paper with this. Uh, you could have a similar situation where Trump loses or the Republicans lose in 2022 or more likely maybe 2024 this happens. And then what? A replay of, of what happened after this election, except do these sections of capital in this time back a Trump move, assuming he runs? Well, I, what I, I, I actually think the Republicans are looking at several avenues here. They're as, as crazy as this sounds, a block of them that think Trump wasn't radical enough and are, you know, talking you know, stuff that you think might well lead to the push. Um, but that's, I think, a very small minority. I think a Trump light approach, uh, as you got in Virginia, might well work. Uh, helped along when the Democrats just go around saying, I'm not, we're not Trump, uh, which, you know, the Democratic candidate did exactly that. Um, but there is also this problem, which is, look, if you study what's been happening for in political money in the state level, and in, you can, we, we mentioned this at the end of the paper, you can see Robert Kagan's basically alluded to it in a piece, uh, was that, I think that was in the Washington Post. You can see lots of Republicans being flooded with cash uh, for jobs that bear on counting the votes in elections. And somebody is obviously out there trying to get control of vote counting, uh, a sort of creeping uh, January 6th strategy, if you like, of recount. Um, and there's a political effort underway in the republic to, to get control of that process now that you know that that's a you call that a putsch well yeah maybe uh i mean it would be if you like january 6 without the riot just imagine if pence had gone in and said uh you know what i'm going to send this back to the states as, as trump was to the so they can just the state legislature so they can decide uh what to do about these electors um that type of thing, I think, is the thing to watch for. It's a real danger, and I, I'm frankly a little taken aback at how passive the Justice Department under Biden has been on this. I know they're running investigations of this, but I'm not the only person watching those, including former members of that Justice Department, who are uh, looking questionably at, questioningly at uh, at precisely the pace and intensity of those investigations. I mean, these folks need to get some results out there, and they need to get them out pretty fast. Let, let me just, let me just to be, to, if I understand this correctly, uh, state legislatures and in, in Republican-controlled states are essentially positioning themselves to be able to create their own list of electoral voters in spite of what the outcome of the election might be. Well, yeah, or uh, yes, or mandate uh, add restrictions on there, except it's not just the legislatures. Often the strategic uh, office is secretary of state, uh, which runs typically on its own, you know, not usually as part of the ticket, but separately. 
The sec I mean, nobody put big money into Secretary of State. Off. There were always some because they were important for political turnout. Uh, they often decide who can uh, run legitimate canvassing and things like that. I've seen that even in the state of Massachusetts, you know, where they were telling, you know, uh, some of the affluent towns uh, that they could run voter registration and the Lowell and Lawrence people were complaining they couldn't, um, but um, or not much of a thing. But Secretary of State jobs are suddenly get, uh, seeing lots of money coming in. I mean, this is crazy. This is a war. I mean, you should not, it, it should take nobody uh, more than a millisecond to realize what's going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I don't know what the Democratic Party's response to it is. So far, they've had, I mean, the ostrich. They ought to make it the national bird instead of the eagle under the Democrats here. I, I, I can't figure what. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've heard from some people that follow some lawyers that are involved in this issue. But you, you could easily have a situation where a state legislature controlled by the Republicans say, we don't trust the vote count. We don't think the Dems actually won. So we're going to pick the Electoral College. And and like you say, that's a form of putsch. Yeah, it is. It's the thing to watch rather more than an actual putsch. I mean, the 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 January sixth riot, whatever we want to call it, insurrection, was, if you like, aberrant in that that was uh, a desperation move. Um, at the last second. Well, that was a, that was the final act of a failed coup. That wasn't the yeah, right. that yeah. wasn't yeah, the, yeah. that was not the main act. Uh, yeah, right. It wasn't supposed to be like that. That I mean, it was instead the exactly what they tried to put over on Pence, which didn't happen. Okay, we're we're. I know you got to run because you you gave me a hard deadline here. So we're going to do another segment. And we're uh, we're going to dig into some of the other uh, really important issues raised in your we paper. Got to talk, got to talk farms, trade, and the economics of this. I mean, that's uh, what's coming. Know, we, we'll do that. We'll it, actually we'll do agriculture in the next uh, segment because that's really fascinating. All right, thanks again, Tom, and thank you for joining us on the analysis.news.